Okay, we are recording. All right, so um, the uh, what are you doing? Stop it. Come up here. Sorry, there's a delay while Dennis gets situated. All right, well, quit, quit bugging me. You know. Um. Put off there. Um, collect my thoughts. What was I saying? Oh yeah. So the um, final exam is going to be primarily 20th century stuff, and um, but there will be information uh, or questions about uh, you know information from the uh, rest of the class. Um, and you know certain things that recur, like neo like the classic, like ancient art, ancient, ancient design, classicism, neoclassicism, um, you know stuff from the nineteenth century. All that stuff could be in it, um, but as it, um, as in the past, you know you will have the opportunity to look up information when you're taking it. So I recommend you do that. Um, and so there, and the last, uh, vocabulary form assignment is going to be eliminated since it's too late. I feel it's a little late to introduce something new. So work on your final vocabulary cards, get ready for the final exam. Um, I've reopened the last, um, the 19th century quiz and forum, and also the um, midterm vocabulary cards, since there are just a few people that still have it, have those to do. Um, so, and those will be open through next next Wednesday midnight. So, okay, any questions about that? Okay, good. All uh, right. So tonight, uh, last, so um, last time we talked about Art Deco and the Bauhaus, which is the early, early modernist stuff. Modernist that's like modernism with a capital M. And uh, you know, the, this what is considered to be modernism goes back to the nineteenth century, and it really is the. Um, off the keyboard. Dennis, come on. Um, yeah. You're going to, I'm going to kick you off of here. You distract me. All right. Um, so modernism, like the uh, modern art design architecture, I think you can take it back to the 19th century when there was a break with classicism and neoclassicism. The, um, in art, the Impressionists, I think, get credit for uh, making the big break with neoclassical artwork uh, with their very different um, approach, like non-classical approach to making artwork uh, in terms of um, subject matter and um, like, you know, what, is, what I recall being referred to as genre scenes, like just people carrying out everyday activities or just kind of normal, like, uh, you know, normal stuff. The, in the, like a uh, traditional neoclassical art with a capital A up until you get the, you know, until you, you get the, the impressionists, um, the subject matter of art was limited to what was considered to be proper subjects, such as history, religion, mythology, um, military commemorations, uh, formal portraiture. These kinds of things were considered to be the real art and the real subject of art. And everything else 
I mean, why you would make a painting of two, you know, some, some men playing cards in a cafe, I don't know. That was more like the attitude of the art establishment up until you get the impressionists that scenes of everyday life were just not interesting or important enough to be art. And the impressionists changed that. And I think the introduction of something like the camera, like film, like, you know, film camera allowed the, you know, allowed, um, you know, anyone using a camera to capture an image of everyday life. And they became, it started to become more interesting. And um, so what we're calling modernism in design and architecture is another break with tradition. So we talked about the, the Bauhaus, the Bauhaus Institute last week, which technically the Bauhaus Institute is a, uh, it was part of, and originally it was part of a bigger institution, like a state, um, state run, like a public, you know, I guess, I don't know if they had public school the way we have it in the U.S., but a state institution for like art design and eventually split up on itself. Um, World War I was a really important event in leading to this break with tradition because the, um, a lot of European nations were still led by monarchies and they were very traditional and conservative. And those uh, monarchies had these very old treaties and alliances with other nations. And when World War I started, one, you know, like um, Serbia went to war with Russia, or no, uh, Serbian assassinates the uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria Hungary, and then Serbia and Austria Hungary are at war. Serbia has a treaty with Russia that Russia will come in on its side. Austria Hungary has a treaty with Germany that it will come in on its side. Um, the French, the English, the Italians, everybody all of a sudden were obliged to go to war with each other, like all like, like choose a side and go to war based on treaties. And it was very destructive. And so the modernists felt that it was um, like the, you know, the, the people who led the Bauhaus were, felt that it was very important, like crucial to use the industrial capabilities that they now had to produce, to make the world better rather than worse. So chemical weapons were not a way to make the world a better place. Uh, using chemistry to produce more and more sophisticated uh, colorants and more and more beautiful um, ways to color material, that's a better way to use industry. So there is an idealism to the sort of early, like the Bauhaus modernism. And um, they did try to do like, you know, um, low cost housing, prefabricated housing. Uh, a lot of this stuff didn't take off. It was still uh, somewhat in the experimental phase. And I think, as I mentioned last week or with Frank Lloyd Wright, finding um, people that could build what they were designing was not always an easy task. So when you have new ways of making, you know, new ways of building um, either furniture, architecture, especially with like, if you're doing, you know, architecture and interiors, when something is brand new, uh, it can be hard to find someone who's good at building it. So, um, so we're going to talk about Mies van der Rohe tonight, uh, and then we're going to talk about the mid some uh, mid century modern, uh, mostly centered around Herman Miller and Knoll International. Um, so Mies van der Rohe, I mentioned all this about modernism because he really refined a lot of what I would call the Bauhaus modernism and what is often referred to as the international style. And 
know, international style is more of a universal style. Stay there. And it can be applied anywhere because it does it's not bound to tradition and so it it uh it could be built in germany england the united states japan china india just as well and it would be the same everywhere because the what they were really trying to do is come up with something that has no link to tradition that it is a brand new thing i believe i mentioned in talking about walter gropius uh, last week that he, uh, he writes in a, there was a, it's a, a biography that I, of his that I read, which was very, very good. It's about Gropius and the, and the Bauhaus called Bauhaus, a crucible of modernism. Um, he had shared that, um, when he was in school as an ar a young architecture student, uh, at the end of the 19th century, he and his classmates were told, that really the best thing you can do is copy the successful examples of past architects and architectural styles, because all of the really great stuff has already been established. And so they're telling all this like generation of young architects, there is nothing new to be made. So just be content copying, like getting, you know, get good at doing what's already been done. That's not satisfying. And it's also like the idea it was it was a it was a very popular notion in the late 19th century that civilization had been refined to its um, highest point, and <clears throat> we you know like civil like European civilization at that point in the 19th late 19th century was done. I can't how can you imagine it being better? We're here. We've arrived. Um, you know, there was this uh, notion like uh, social Darwinism is something that uh, occurred. It was a way to, you know, it was a way to reinforce racism. Um, it was also, uh, uh, I read this at some point in, I can't remember exactly where I read this, but uh, it was a, a popular notion amongst the um, upper classes of England that the Victorian gentleman, the English Victorian gentleman was the, culmination and end of, evo of human evolution. We're done. Um, and you think like everything that's happened in like the last 125, 30, 50 years, uh, like, yeah, you're not finished. So, um, so this, this idea that, you know, maybe there was just some fatigue that they just didn't, they were just like, like, needed a break and didn't want to do anything. But, you know, um, there are a lot of factors that went into driving the modernist goal to strip away everything, like all tradition. So they wanted everything out. Um, all right, so Mies van der Rohe was the last director of the Bauhaus Institute. It was closed in 1933 by the Nazis. That's when they took over German government. Um, and because the Bauhaus had a connection with um, socialists, and they also employed Jewish faculty, uh, they're weirdos, they are anti-traditional, um, you know, Mies van der Rohe was chosen to be the, the director. He was, Gropius begged him to do it um, because Mies was, was known for being apolitical. He didn't care whose side you were on. If you had the money to pay him, great, I'll build it for you. That was his sort of, you know, he, and he was not one of the, he was not one of the idealistic modernists that thought I'm going to make, the world a better place for everybody. He wanted to make beautiful things and beautiful design, beautiful buildings. And, you know, one of the criti one, one critique against Mies van der Rohe that I think sometimes does stand up 
is that his buildings are difficult to live in or use if you don't use them or live in them the way he intended. So it's a little strict. Um, I personally wouldn't mind trying to live in what I, you know, the Farnsworth house the way he meant for it to be lived in. But, you know, I probably got too much stuff to live in a house like that. Maybe I just need a big one. <clears throat> but um, but we will, I will show you images of the, of, um, the Farnsworth house. Um, he originally designed the Farnsworth house. It was for uh, Dr. Edith Farnsworth. He originally designed it with no window treatments, just glass all the way around. And she was like, no, you're going to put in, you're going to put some window treatments in here. He's like, you're out in the middle of nowhere. Nobody's looking at you. Like, yeah, <laughs> put some window treatments in. There's like, if you, you'll see this, it's just glass all the way around. It's just like a big rectangular loop. Um, and it's like, you got to have some like privacy. You know, he thought it looked better. It was more his idea without the window treatments. And I can understand they just kind of spoil the effect, I guess. But um, I would definitely want some window treatments. Okay. Um, international style. This is from Abram's Guide. Uh, oh, I need to get my better glasses on for this. Excuse me, guys. Okay. In 1932, Philip Johnson and Henry Russell Hitchcock curated architecture and international exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. The style it documented, named after the accompanying book, is considered the purest expression of 20th century modernism. Evolved from the concepts of Bauhaus masters Walter Gropius and Ludwig Nies van der Rohe and Marcel Breuer, and their contemporary Le Corbusier, who was born in Switzerland and practiced mostly in France, international style architecture celebrated geometric form and modern materials like glass, steel, concrete. Its buildings were severe flat roofed structures of steel and concrete with broad swaths of windows and without ornament, a revolt against traditional architectural styles. And it launched a new look with interiors that were open, light filled and furnished with objects that followed the tenets of functionalist design. The international style was embraced as a statement of modernity for the rectilinear curtain wall corporate headquarters that dotted the American landscape in the boom years after World War II. It was ideally suited to the demands of post-war construction, both economical and efficient. It provided maximum floor space and facilitated the use of machine-made modular elements. So um, in the U.S., there was a need to build a lot. And um, so taller buildings, especially in a place like New York City or Chicago, where um, the way you, you know, if you have a patch of land, you have a, a city block to work with, the way you can increase the real estate is by going upward. And so taller and taller buildings give you more real estate. And uh, this already had been shown in the 1930s, you know, 1920s and 1930s with tall buildings, even uh, in the you know, 1890s in Chicago, like the Reliance Building, Chicago, the, um, uh, which is what is like one of the one of the first tall buildings, and a very modern one at that. So. Um, Emphasizing structure and functionality rather than warmth and creature comforts, the style failed to gain acceptance in, in residential, it failed to gain the acceptance in residential design that it did for office structures, such as the celebrated Seagram Building in New York, a paradigm of 20th century corporate culture. It was more successful 
successfully applied to high-rise apartments than to single-family residences, except perhaps for the innovative California homes designed by Rudolf Schindler and Richard Neutra, precursors of the casual, split-level homes of mid-century modernism. So um, <clears throat> something that uh, Mr. Smith talks about in the other book uh, is that after World War II in Europe, because they needed to rebuild a lot uh, and they needed to do so quickly, uh, modern design could be produced, like modern objects and modernist objects could be produced much more quickly and less uh, and, with, and at less cost, cost than more traditional looking furnishings. And so that broke down the resistance to it because people needed it. And so it was easier to accept it when it was a matter of like, you know, we don't have a lot of money and we don't have a lot of time. We need to do this now. So that the need helped create more acceptance. In the U.S., since the, the World War II was not fought in the United States, with a few exceptions, um, it really, like the um, part of what, led to like modern, like, like mid-century modern being more acceptable is that, you know, there was a lot of housing needed. And, um, the night after World War II, during World War II, the United States built up an enormous industrial capacity. And when the war ended, what do you do with it? You turn it in, you know, you turn, you change it to make other things. And so uh, the production of building materials, furnishings, automobiles, um, all of that um, led to just more and more products available in the United States. And the United States was in great shape financially after World War II because we didn't have to rebuild the way Europe did. And Asia as well, because Japan was destroyed, uh, China and Korea were also like had to rebuild after the Japanese had uh, had been driven out of those of that those parts of Asia. Okay. Well, I think what we'll first do is talk about old buddy, old pal. Meets. Right, I'm going to share my screen now. There we go. So here is the title page of the International Style Exhibition Catalog, <clears throat> which features a house by Mies van der Rohe called the Tugendhat House. It's for the, um, well, it's, this is built in what is uh, now the Czech Republic. There he is, the man himself enjoying a uh, stogie in his, uh, this is uh, his, um, he lived in an apartment, like a big apartment I think this is on Ohio Street, uh, downtown in Chicago. Uh, Mies came to the U.S., left Germany in the later 1930s, when it was very clear that the Nazis were not going to let him um, work independently. Uh, he was known, and he was really, you know, uh, as you know, probably probably the best known architect in. Germany. Uh, so he left, he came to Chicago and took over the architecture program at what was what was originally called the Armour Institute and then became the Illinois Institute of Technology. I believe I mentioned this last time. Uh, note the uh, like traditional panel, paneling on the walls of his home. Uh, he did not, to my knowledge, he did not live in the kind of buildings he designed. I mean, his, 
and you know he had modern furnishings, but that traditional, uh, more traditional interior. Not that he has to. I mean, you know, you can decide you're going to build it for, like, make other people live in it, but you don't want to. Um, okay, so here, um, the uh, ancient museum in Berlin uh, by Carl Friedrich Schinkel. Schinkel was like the 19th century god of architecture or god of architects in, um, in Germany. And he sort of established this like um, more modern neoclassical style based largely in Greek architecture and um, Greek temple architecture. Greek and Roman, but a lot of his stuff, a lot of Schinkel stuff was Greek. So here, this is a, uh, you know, Mies van der Rohe designed a lot of, he designed a lot before he left Germany. And he also, as I think I showed you last week, he dreamt up architecture, like tall buildings and buildings of glass and steel and concrete that at that time probably couldn't have been built yet. Or either because people weren't ready, probably because mainly because people weren't ready for it. Uh, it technically, they could have been built from a, from an engineering and a you know um, architectural standpoint. So um, <clears throat> Mies was certainly aware of Schinkel, uh, and no, I would say he no doubt respected Schinkel, but. Um, you know, he very quickly in, in his more mature work moved on to, you know, like here's one of his uh, imagined off, uh, concrete office building. You know, uh, you can give him, give Mies credit for this or blame him, depending on how you feel about some of the, uh, you know, modern architecture. But he did point the way. So you can see here, like the, like the, uh, the windows in this drawing, um, you no, know, they they just go floor to ceiling, and they are not part of the structure. The structure is held up by you know you can see the columns on the interior, and this is something that is, you know, it's a part of of modern architecture. The structure is inside and set back from, you know, it's often set back from the exterior wall, and then you get what is called a glass curtain wall. And uh, curtain wall just refers to the outer, the outer wall of a building, and so glass curtain wall is if that outer wall is, that outer surface is glass. So this is a, uh, a you know, a project he dreamed up in the, you know, in 1920, a glass skyscraper pro skyscraper project, which was not built in 1920. Um, there is a, uh, has any of you seen Lake Point Tower in Chicago? It's down just, it's just like west of Navy Pier. It's like right, you know, before you like go out to Navy Pier. Uh, that was designed by two of his students from IIT. And it really does, I believe it is um, just a direct um, homage to this, to Mies van der Rohe, that this is something that he designed you know, he dreamt this up in 1920 and never built it, and so they designed something like it and built it. Another glass skyscraper project. So he was a dreamer, an artist. I think he was he would have a really an artistic and sculptural sensibility. So there's some uh, plan like uh, plans for. So you know, he would just he would design things just out of just because he you know out of interest, um, even if they could not be built. So on a charcoal drawing of another skyscraper project. So he was ready before anybody else was. Here is uh, Philip Johnson, um, the guy, the architect that organized the International um, Style Show. Um, <clears throat> and he was a, um, 
he was a follower of Mies van der Rohe. So this is a uh, 1978 high-rise Pennzoil place in Houston. And here, this is in Chicago, 30, 333 West Wacker. John Portman, the West Bonaventure Hotel in Los Angeles. There's a very similar building in Detroit called the Renaissance Center, which has these like this, um, it's five towers, four towers around, around a central tower. And I believe it's um, in Atlanta, Peachtree Plaza, uh, similar. Really like this um, fortress architecture that was popular in the 70s after, uh, after the 60s, um, where like the building seemed to be, it, it, it just seemed to be like a, like getting into it seemed like a little bit of a challenge. There's Lake Point Tower in Chicago. I am Pei, Chinese American architect. So now here, this is um, Mies van der Rohe, like, like uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, was a proponent of the open plan, open floor plan. And he really felt that, a, that it is a very modern idea that you give your, like that you have freedom of movement in your home really in any architectural space. There should be freedom of movement. So this does have, um, you know, this, this um, project does have the, um, like, you know, tighter spaces where there are room, rooms are largely cut off from each other, but there are no doors stopping you from con just continuing your movements. So it's similar to Prairie, the prairie style or prairie school. It's very flat, um, overall horizontal organization. And, um, you know, just in terms of this, like composing with rectangles, this is a painting by the Dutch artist and designer Theo van Duisburg. And, um, very, he was he was very much aligned with the Bauhaus um, artists and designers, but this idea of composing with uh, rectangles and of course the the primary red, yellow, blue, black, and white that was um, those were considered to be like basic, like really fundamental color. That um, what are you doing? Stop chewing on me. There are basic fundamental colors that are a way to um, move, a, a really like a way to get back to something that is simple and universal. Which is, you know, that's how that's how you that, that's how you kind of like defeat the classes, the like neoclassicism, is to go back to a time before, and that's when you get into like really just like basic and elementary stuff that you work with and you build sophisticated things. So here, this is a uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, Coonley house in Riverside, Illinois, uh, floor plan. It's, uh, sorry, that's not the greatest, most clear, but that is, um, and it can, it's an example of open plan. You know, I've made that point with, um, Mies. So here, one of the things that really, um, helped put Mies van der Rohe and modern architecture, modernist architecture, uh, so it helped promote it, was the Barcelona Pavilion that Mies van der Rohe designed. So um, similar to these like, like 19th century expositions, like the Paris Exposition and the Columbian Exposition in Chicago, uh, this one in Barcelona in 1929, was, a lot of nations were there showcasing what's good about their country. And um, Mies van der Rohe was chosen to design the, the German pavilion. And so he designed it in this very modernist way. And he designed it, his, his idea 
is that this was the future of the German house. So it is, um, there's, it's really, a, I mean, to me, it's the celebration of space and open space and, you know, um, So you have this nice reflecting pool. Uh, you can see these columns have uh, their chrome plated columns. You'll see a picture of them uh, closer up um, in a later slide, but it's like flat roof. It says like rectangular planes. So if we go back to this, Theo van Duisburg, um, it's the same idea. So this is the plan of the Barcelona Pavilion. There is an exterior view. Um, figurative sculpture, um, you know, Mies van der Rohe was not entirely traditional, or I guess he was not, he was okay with certain, like figurative sculpture was okay with him. Other modernists, would not have been, they would not, I don't know if they would have put something such so, so traditional or so realistic into it because realism was considered to be, um, you know, realism in art was considered to be dishonest. Okay, so you see these sort of like cross shaped, like in plan that would be like a cross with a column, but this like, like uh, these steel chromium, chrome plated columns, floor to ceiling windows. This is a very new idea. One of, you know, one of the first times that this, anything like this was, was built. So this would have been the first time anybody was seeing anything like this. So uh, it, ha it has uh, travertine marble as it's like, you know, for the cladding on the walls. And there you see the Barcelona chair, one of the most recognizable pieces of furniture in the history of furniture is the Barcelona chair. Mies van der Rohe designed the Barcelona chair for the Barcelona pavilion. And at this um, exposition, the first visitor to every pavilion would be, or the first visitors would be the queen and the king of Spain. And they would sign, they would, all, they would go around and they would sign the guest book first to all of the all of these pavilions and Mies van der Rohe imagined this chair as like the chair that they would sit in when they signed the book or a chair that they would sit in when they visited and so he kind of did imagine this as something that would have been appropriate for royalty now they might not agree but that was this is um where he's coming from. Here is a clearer slide. The uh, the chair is a, this is like an original. You see like uh, there's a modern version that was, uh, that um, Noel started to produce in 1948 that uh, has like, it's a, um, well in this, like each of the, uh, each of the leather sections like each pan, each small little square of leather is a separate piece and they're all sewn together it's very expensive uh noel did it as just like one big piece with the buttons and the, and the stitching uh so that it's a much um smoother surface but the, the chair has a pretty steep pitch to it which is the angle of the seat and the back when you sit in it you Stay in it. It, hold, it really does hold you there. Has anyone sat in a chair? This uh, this chair. Yeah. Was it comfortable? I find it to be a really. I mean, it, it's a very comfortable chair. Um, how did you get out of it? You got to use your abs. You got to use your abs. <laughs> it is. No armrests and a steep, like your, your butt's low when you're sitting in this thing. It's like you got to, uh, 
use your mighty abs to get out. Um, so it's great. So the this minor design flaw, I guess you could say, but it's about sitting in, not getting out of. Um, so that's um, well. But you know, if you've seen this, you go around to. You know, if you go around Chicago to like um, condominiums, uh, corporate high rises, like off, like you know, office buildings, you'll see this chair. You can't. I mean, like it's still Noel still makes it, and Noel still sells it as, and it really is like if you know, people don't know anything else about furniture. They know that this is a that this chair has style. And it is successful. And if you're going to put, if you want to project success, this is something that I, I you know, Florence Knoll was very good at selling this to people. If you're going, if you want to project success, then you should have good design. Okay. So this, uh, the chair on the lower right, that's a Marcel Breuer chair, um, the Vasily chair. That is um, another, like, you know, it's like the steel frame, you know, in this, the, uh, with the Barcelona chair, that sort of cross, like, X-framed steel chair, like, like the, is, um, they, like, those are cast, and um, it's a little bit more expensive to produce than, like, the, you know, than the, uh, tube of steel actually this it's it's a you know if you got uh, I'm not sure what they're selling this for now but like I would expect like you know 10,000 from like getting a getting a like a Barcelona chair from Knoll uh, I'd have to I'd have to look it up maybe between five and ten thousand Okay, so here's Tugendhat House in Brno, Czechoslovakia, which it, it was Czechoslovakia um, at that time. So this is from 1930. So this is a private residence to a private client, 1930. Um, that curving wall around the dining area is made of ebony. That is an African wood, and that would have been a very expensive part of the design right there. So um, he liked using beautiful materials and um, that's very beautiful. But that much imported ebony is going to cost the client a fair amount of money. So here is the interior of the living room. There are interior potted plants, and then you have the uh, tall, like large windows for the exterior. And you see the big um, travertine marble wall on the left side. Farnsworth House in Plano, Illinois. A place you can visit. So this is uh, so the um, like the upper rectangle there. You see the house. There's the like uh, the plat like the stairs, platform stairs, and then you get up to the porch, and then the house, and. It's um, open plan with really, there's very little, you know, very little in terms of uh, obstruction within the, within the house. So here's a shot of the interior. As he would have it arranged. Daybed, 
knees, chairs, fireplace. Lo I really love the wood. Um, you know, this is uh, this would have been like a concrete with uh, the travertine laid down on top of it. So this is around the uh, it's like an, uh, this is an, a shot of the original kitchen. And they did install a uh, he, he did relent and install a track in the ceiling for curtains. So there, there. It's a nice looking place. Um, I think I would think you'd have to know you want to live in a place like that in order to move into it. Okay. So here, so Mies came. Mies van der Oak moved to Chicago. He came. He was um, recruited to come to Chicago. Um, take over the architecture program at the Armour Institute. And um, he made, you know, they changed the name to Illinois Institute of Technology soon after he moved here. And uh, he was allowed to redesign the, like, redesign the campus or a lot of the campus with new modern buildings. So this is down like... Um, State Street and like 33rd, 35th in Chicago. And so here are the buildings. Crown Hall is, um, can say, you know, Crown Hall is, kind of, is sort of symbolic of the architectural style of IIT's campus. And, um, can see the opaque glass on the lower levels and then the clear glass above. Mm. Some uh, detail. There's so, you know, like an, a, this corner, this is like a, like showing some of the beam, like that vertical, like steel, um, kind of projecting out that's that's as much detail as you get. Like that's ornament in modernism, and that's all you get. So here's the uh, the interior. So this truss, you can see like this, like um, what is it, like a truss structure? It's like those big horizontal structural elements that go over the roof. It's actually kind of like a. Um, like the, the roof hangs off of that. And what that means is that the interior doesn't have to have columns because the structure is all around, it's kind of like wrapped around the, like, you know, the side and the top of the building. So it allowed them to largely eliminate columns from the interior, leaving the, the, the uh, interior largely open. Uh, that kind of you know, I've, that that, that um, solution has been used for a lot of like you know for some like other buildings in Chicago. Um, all right, so here, so this is meant as a like flexible space where um, classes could be moved in, uh, exhibitions are exhibitions can be held there. Um, I'm not sure it's the best place to concentrate when there's a whole lot of other stuff going on. You're supposed to be uh, drafting, but eh. It's about the space. It's not about you. All right, so here are some other buildings. Um, you know, there is some brick, like simple brick cladding on some of the buildings. Um, minerals and metal research building, 
the boiler plant. I love the boiler plant building. That's cool. The car, the cool, you know, the great cars also don't don't hurt, but chapel. So they just let me you know, take over and uh, do it all. So um, as you know, after Mies died in the late 1960s, <coughs> um, you know, if you don't maintain this or like, you know, um, upgrade when you, if you don't upgrade technology like air conditioning in a way that is respectful of the building, you get stuff like this. So it's unfortunate that they did not, uh, uh, you kind of like, if Mies isn't around, things drift. Okay, so here is the Seagram building that is uh, mentioned in the uh, Abrams Guide. Very tall. Um, and, you know, something that I like, I've, I've always liked this about some of the very tall modern, modern um, skyscrapers is the way the building seems to be standing up on legs. Uh, you know, there's plenty of structure going through the middle of the building. But you can have like the glass lobby, the like sort of glassed in lobby look like it's like the building is just kind of like standing up. So like ra uh, raised above it. But you know, like those, those windows aren't holding up anything. It's all the structure around it. I uh, hear the uh, Four Seasons restaurant with the interior designed by Philip Johnson. Uh, luxurious. Uh, this is uh, the labor house in New York City by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. So, like, there are other architecture firms, and Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, which is often referred to simply as SOM, there they were a big commercial firm that had they they were responsible for building some of the tallest buildings like the Hancock Tower in Chicago, the Sears, Sears Tower, uh, whatever it's called now, it's the Sears Tower. Um, you know, they, um, <clears throat> they built and skip, you know, SOM is still building. You know, they're, they're still in, in business. They're still practicing. And, you know, a firm like SOM with building tall buildings, and having multiple clients uh, potentially in a building, um, SOM opened like they started to hire interior designers. And uh, we're going to talk about Florence Knoll. I guess I could talk a little bit. I've already mentioned something about Florence Knoll, but always worth repeating information about her. Um, she was, you know, Florence Knoll was really one of the like the first modern like commercial interior designer. And she helped to create the discipline where it's a lot of like, you know, there's technical knowledge, there is a knowledge of there's like, you know, um, an understanding of aesthetics, um, knowing what you're like giving your, like knowing what your client needs and really ought to have. So they're in it too, SOM. All right, here, Chicago, 860, 880 Lakeshore Drive. There's also 900 Lakeshore Drive, which is a later one and a little bit nicer. There's floor plan, or I guess a site plan. There they are under construction back in 1952. And there they are finished. So it's, in a way, it's got some, you know, in terms of its, like, its facade, there are some similarities with Crown Hall and the IIT buildings. Uh, that is a Louis Sullivan high rise on the left. I'm not sure why, what happened to my text on this one. That's, I think, the building, in, the Louis Sullivan building in St. Louis. Um, yeah, Louis, Louis Sullivan did help point the way. These are some artistic photos. 
This is from outside one of them. So it's really this like three-dimensional rectangular spatial composition when you take these two buildings in, you know, into consideration. They're, it's very, I actually, I like, I've been, I've, I've walked through the thing. I've walked past them and just like walked around them uh, a few times. And it's really, I enjoy the experience of like what they do to the space around the buildings. Lobby, Barcelona chairs. So at this point, these, are, these chairs are being made by Null. For all lots of like broad leafed plants. Here is an interior of one of the apartments. Nice views. Simple modern interior. There you go. So Mies van der Rohe, I think, was he was kind of the guy that helped point the way to um, whoops, like um, I think you know. With he was in terms of like the modern high rise. If you've ever been in or lived in a high rise in a city, um, you can thank Mies van der Rohe for helping to make it possible and to sort of try to create the look for them. And this is um, IIT's campus. Oh yeah. So, um, you know, after his Mies van der Rohe's passing, this is the student center at IIT. Um, I took this, um, Oh gosh, this is, was this from the dorms? Or I think this is from the dorms across the street. Um, oh no, this is from this, that's right. This is like, that's not the Green Line station. The Green Line goes right over it. And a Dutch architect named Rem Kohlhaas worked on this student center with um, a group of graduate students. It was part of a competition. And um, they built this big, like a sound muffler around the tracks and you really can't hear it when you're in, when you're inside the student center, when a train goes over, uh, you can hear it a little bit, but it's really very well. The sound is, is suppressed very, very well, but you know, um, Mies van der Rohe made IIT a destination for architecture and engineering students from around the world. And so, since you know he died in the 1960s, um, it's still a destination for architects and designers. But some of the architecture has changed. So this um, this site for the uh, for the student center, this was just like an empty. It was just like an empty lot. The train, like you know, the Green Line runs right right you know right through this, um, and it had always been considered a poor site to build something. Uh, and there were these like paths that students would take just like cutting crisscross all across this patch of green. And when they decided to build the student center here, they preserved the paths that students take, that the students would take. Um, is that it? Oh no, I cut some of the slides out. Uh, has anyone been to the IIT's campus in this student center? It's a fun and kind of disorienting building to be in because the like the path the pathways like the, the hallways through it um, they kind of like stay in this like they're in the same uh, direction as the paths that were that like students had always taken across this patch of grass before they built the building. So, uh, and I love the way that the big tube looks like it's, it's sort of smashing the building down. So this is a very, this is like really like more like this is contemporary architecture. It was built within the last, it was probably built like maybe 
gosh, it's almost 20 years now since this was completed. It's a lot more fun. Mies was not about fun. He was serious. Architecture should be done a very a certain way. But you can see some of these unfinished, like the unfinished, uh, like the um, this like uh, wall board on this, like the board on the ceiling, where there are holes from where it was stapled to the structure behind it. They just took a broad putty knife and just put patch put a patch over the hole and left it. Normally, you would paint that. But it was a decision like to see, like, you know, partly because it's an architecture school, they want to see what's underneath. Uh, it's something that, you know, there are all kinds of opportunities to learn from that. But in another respect, that green, that blue sort of like minty green is very, it's kind of beautiful color. And the pattern made by the patching is intentional. So um, it's the kind of building where you could go through it and decide, I like that, I don't like that, I like that, I don't like that. But it's, ex it's, it's all a great big experiment. All right. That is Mies. Any questions about that? What do you think of him in general? I like the style, but I think it, I couldn't live in that. I have too much stuff and <laughs> I'm too messy. <laughs> it looks best when it's like someone's cleaning it constantly, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it just seems idealized. Like I'm not sure how many people live like that. That is a very good point. Um, it's, you know, but I think it's similar to like, if you look at, um, interiors in any kind of a publication, whether it's print, um, social media, I mean, why would you present it as if like it needs to be cleaned? Right. Um, yeah, yeah but there's like zero clutter. <laughs> that is definitely the idea of having, you know, like. Comparing it to, compared to Victorian, Victorian is like, the more clutter, the better. Just like, this is interesting, just plop it down over here. Um, you know, it's this, like, kind of anything goes style. And it was, you know, I really think that people overdid it, and you get a lot of, you know, pe other people that want to pull back from that excess. It seems kind of cold also, like. Even compared to Frank Lloyd Wright stuff, it's kind of cold. True. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, I would say much more severe. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, that's, I, I mean, to me, Mies van der Rohe has always been more of an artist. He's, he's like, he's, he's more of an artist than a lot of other architects. Did he design the um, IBM building downtown? Yes. Yeah, I yeah, worked I think, in that building. Yeah, I think that was finished after he died, but it was oh. it was started when he was still alive, or it may have been started after he died. But it was it's definitely his design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like um, the um, Federal Plaza mm -hmm. in Chicago, right where like the post office. The big Calder sculpture, and then the uh, I think it's Klusinski. It's a Polish, the Polish name Federal Building. I think it's. Um, but yeah, those I, actually I like I like that whole area, um, like the um, the granite um, of the plaza continues into the post office it's just polished inside the building mm. you see the sidewalk all the way around it is that same granite but when you when it it's like inside the window it's polished and finished uh, so it really looks like the, the post office was just set down on the plaza 
which I think is a really, it's a beautiful move. I mean, it's, it wasn't, but that's what they, you know, that's what he makes it look like. So that's definitely an artistic move. So. It was actually funny um, where I went to grad school uh, at University of Chicago, our social work building was built by Mies. Mm. It's very similar to Crown Plaza, I think it yeah. is. But it's funny because everyone would get really annoyed um, with all the beautiful, like, gothic architecture and everything at University of Chicago. A lot of people would be, like, didn't get the modern take more. And people would be like, why did we get this building? Mm -hmm. Which was just always very comical. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Well, that's, you know, it's, um, I think that, that something that's traditional, like gothic, is a, it's easier to understand it or it's just rec it's just like more people recognize it as a good style and the modern you're not really sure yeah like a lot of people just like didn't get it but they had a lot of the barcelona furniture actually in the yeah. building too, which was cool yeah that's cool I haven't been in that one. I've been to the U of C campus a few times. Um, and I have to say, I don't mind. I mean, like, I don't mind the Gothic revival um, architecture. Um, I think that, you know, I think it, it looks good and sort of appropriate for University of Chicago, too, uh, since it's been around for a long time. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, now, I mean, now they're getting more, like, more modern buildings. Uh, around in, in on USC's campus, so so take that traditionalists. But there is one that's um, the it's I think it's its nickname is the Barney Building because it's this like Barney Barney the dinosaur purple at U of C. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't know what building that is. I'm not sure I haven't it, been there. I'm not sure when it was when it was built, but it was it was not that long ago. Hmm. So. Well, now I appreciate the building a bit more, although I'm not there. Yeah. No, I I had to I had to learn about modernist architecture in order to start to appreciate it better, and why it was like why it was done like what, like what are the reasons for it. Um, cause I think it is, I think it is important. Um, you know, if any, like any era that people, you know, live in any era of, of human civilization, there are always unique, um, elements to that era. And the idea of always looking back to, you know, Greek and Roman and, and in some cases, Egyptian, for examples of what we should do today, it really just doesn't make any sense from a creative standpoint. And that was something that the modern you know, people like me were in. They they were just adamant that architecture should look as if it is for now. And so that was why, and that was why they did it. And they were. He was very happy for people to hate him as long as he could drag it kicking and screaming into the present. So. And I'm the first time I saw it, I, I made some some sarcastic remark about Mies van der Rohe and um, someone, some very, very nice friend made it clear to me that I did not understand what I was looking at. And so I shut my mouth and listened. I had a lot of opinions when I started college and they were based in nothing. And I was smart enough when I got embarrassed a few times to just shut my mouth and listen and learn something and be humble enough to know that I really like, no, I don't know what I'm talking. So, and then I, you know, I ended up studying history and the more you read, like, I didn't, I didn't really care that much about American history when I started my history degree, because I was like, oh, you know, I live in this country, you know, I want to learn about other parts of the world. 
and they make you take a lot of American history, you know, history, you know, history of the United States, because you live here, and you're from here. And so then, the more I started reading and learning about it, like, oh wow, this actually is very interesting. You know, explains why things are the way they are around me, or like, I didn't even know that that happened in this country. So, you know, we go through we go through our phases. All right. Uh, next, we're going to talk, we're going to have a break, and then we're going to talk about mid-century modern, what you've all been waiting for. <laughs>